Welcome to Rocksaw Productions, where in this episode we are going to take a snippet out of our live stream interview with Tommy Tellerico, and we are going to talk specifically about his background in the video game industry. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, Gary here with Rocksaw Productions. Now, before we dive into today's episode, I just want to take a second and say thank you for stopping by and checking out what we have going on here today. I really do appreciate it. If you like what you see here, I invite you to check out some of the other content we have here on the channel, including the full four plus hour interview with Tommy Tellerico from Intellivision Entertainment, these guys here behind me. And if you really like what you see here, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button and that bell notification. That way, anytime we do upload any other new content, have new interviews and do live streams, you are kept the most informed and up to date. And what I wanna know from you here today in this episode, did you ever have an original in television? I honestly did not. It was one of those things, we were an Atari family back in the day, so we did not have an in television. And I honestly don't know if I've ever even played on an Intellivision. Recently, in February of 2021, we sat down myself and Life with Matthew, Matthew Bennett, we sat down with Tommy Tellerico of Intellivision to find out some information about the system, to get some questions answered, and to have a pretty frank discussion with them. We didn't really pull a whole lot of punches. What I've done here is I've gone through the entire interview and I'm pulling out different segments to be their own standalone episode. So if you want to just find out about Tommy's background, about the controller, about the hardware, about the developer side of things, you can do that and get through it in more bite-sized snippets. In this episode here, we're going to talk to Tommy about his background in the video game industry. Here we go. For those who are not familiar with your background, like we talk about Earthworm Jim and everything there, uh -oh. that's where I kind of got known of who you are and what is your background in the industry just as a developer musician so on and so forth sure so i've been in the video game industry uh over 32 years now um i've worked on over 350 video games which is a guinness world record which was uh awarded to me in uh, 2008 um for the person who's worked on the most video games in a lifetime so that that was pretty cool my mother's very proud um but the um some of the games that people may know that i've worked on uh, you mentioned earthworm jim from the the early and mid 90s uh before that i did games like disney's aladdin uh terminator on the sega cd cool spot but I also worked on um, the early Madden football games and um, going into like the later 90s, things like um, I was on the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater team, uh, did some work on uh, some of the, uh, the first three Guitar Hero games, um, Metroid Prime with Shigeru Miyamoto. I worked with him for uh, many years and uh, the Sonic franchise. Uh, so a lot of, and, and by the way, you'll notice that Spider-Man, James Bond, Mortal Kombat, you'll notice that I'm only gonna mention all of the good ones. So uh, in that <laughs> list of 350, you know, Babe Ruth didn't hit a home run every time he was up, up at bat. In fact, he led the league in strikeouts too. But, but uh, so uh, you won't be hearing me say uh, wax poetic about Color a Dinosaur and Aquaman for the Xbox. But that being said, um, so I've been doing that for 32 years, audio production, but also, especially back in the old days, like you did everything, right? So game design and I would write the manuals and you'd be producer. And I started out as a games tester and, you know, you kind of do everything back in the day when you're on these small teams of like five, 10 people. Um, and then in the, uh, in the mid nineties, I started a television show with Victor Lucas called the electric playground. And then we did a second one uh, which we, a second TV show called Reviews on the Run or Judgment Day, it was as it was known in the U.S. And so I was doing two half-hour television shows 
every week, 104 episodes wow. a year. And I did that for 12 years. And that show went on to win an Emmy Award and a Telly Award and uh, for Best News Magazine. And, and we were just doing a thing about video games. And keep in mind, this is the mid to late 90s before YouTube, before Twitch, before, you know, and again, this is worldwide syndicated. So uh, so that was a whole other chapter uh, of my career while I was also doing video game music uh, as well. And then in 2002, I started a nonprofit organization, which is a big organization now. It's called the Game Audio Network Guild, or GANG, as the letters spell out. Audiogang.org is the website. And people can go there. And there, we have thousands of members around the world. And I started that because... We wanted to teach people and young people who were coming in or people who wanted to learn how to do video game music. Uh, and so it's a big network of professionals and students and non-professionals. We have a $20,000 scholarship uh, uh, thing that we, we formed back then. And so that was a big thing. And then that same year I started Gang, I also started Video Games Live, which was the first world touring symphony video game concert. Uh, the first show we ever did was at the Hollywood Bowl uh, to tens of thousands of people. And then I've been touring it around for 20 years. Uh, for that. So I've seen a lot of different, I've worked with almost every aspect of the video game industry from marketing to PR to design to production to music to, you know, TV. And I've been on the side of the press and on the other side of the camera. And so it's it's been uh, been pretty crazy. And uh, here I am uh, now within television. So going from being someone who worked on the development side of games, you bought the rights to in television. What was the idea behind, you know, why did you want to buy in television? And what was kind of the, the whole thought process of going from making games to owning a, a game studio, a game company, a, yeah. a brand such as in television? Yeah. Well, so, and television was the system I had growing up. That when I think of that box, you know, behind Matthew, I get I get tears in my eyes. I get I get goosebumps. Um, it brings back so many family memories for me personally. We were an Intellivision family. We got it Christmas in 1980. It had been out a year, and you know, and I played baseball with my dad and my mom would we'd play skiing together and my brother we'd play hockey or or utopia or even math fun because he was a little younger and we'd we'd learn how to you know do math problems and stuff so so you know that's the when i think of in television i think of my own family right and and what happened is you know as i kind of went through the years of being in the industry for so long and doing so many things, I felt that like, you know, going back like four years ago, three, four years ago, I kind of felt like, gosh, you know, like I can't play video games with my parents anymore. Like, like the Wii did it amazing, right? The Wii, like my mom bought a Wii, right? Yeah, my dad too. Right, and they, they never bought video game consoles really, but they could... They could, it was easy to understand. My mom just wanted to go bowling. That's all she'd wanted to do. Boom, throw the, throw the ball down the thing, hit some pins, right? And, and, and that, that system was $249 when it came out with one controller and one tech demo, which was Wii Sports, an incredible tech demo, but it wasn't, you know, a full bowling game. You couldn't even bowl 10, you know, thing. and so, you know, the Wii did it so well. And, and when Nintendo put out the Wii, Keep in mind that everybody was like, before it came out, people were like, oh, Nintendo's done for, they they suck, they're going to get creamed by PlayStation and Xbox, what are they thinking, I hate the name, everyone hates motion controls, you're all, you know, Nintendo's dead, they should just be a software, let's see Zelda on the Xbox, and of course the Wii came out and it kicked everyone's ass, and it was the third biggest home-selling home console at the time of all time, 102 million units sold, generates $50 billion in revenue. And what that proved is that people who don't necessarily play video games all the time are willing to play video games with other people as long as they're presented in an easy and simple way. And so 
but the Wii was 15 years ago. And so like going back four or five years ago, I can't, there wasn't any games I could play with my mom and dad. All of the hyper casual games went over that they would be able to play and understand went over to mobile. But of course the problem with mobile is everything is solitary. Everything is, you're looking at your screen, right? Now there's a couple exceptions. And, and so w- whenever I say stuff, you know, let's take it in the terms of, you know, not specific. Well, yeah, but wait, there's Jackbox. Yes, I know Jackbox is on the mobile and it's amazing and it's fantastic. And there's games like Space Team and Emoji Charades. There are exceptions, but what I'm talking about is the overwhelming majority of hyper-casual games are only on mobile and they're only your head buried in in the phone. And if you look for young families, you know the number one concern of young families is they give their kids too much alone screen time, right? So let's keep that in mind as we're moving forward. So, So I'm looking at this going like, well, I can't play games that my mom and dad would understand on mobile. And, and we would play Jackbox and we would have fun, but there's not a, that that's all you got. And then even my wife, who's a little younger than me, she's 35 years old and a lot younger than me. Uh, no, she, but she's uh, 35. So she grew up playing Pokemon, playing video games, Super Nintendo. Uh, in fact, she had an Intellivision because she had three older brothers. And so her older brothers and her dad kind of passed down the Intellivision to her. So one of her favorite games growing up was Shark Shark. Um, but, and then we would sit down and try to find a video game to play like on the Switch or on the Xbox or on the PlayStation. And there was just nothing that that the both of us could play together. And so, so I Googled it. I said, where's a casual game? Let me find a casual couch co-op game on the Nintendo Switch. Let me Google that, because the eShop is kind of difficult to navigate through. You know, I, I don't think anyone would, would argue with me on that, right? Um, and so I, so I Googled it, and you know what came back? Well, one of the first things that came back was Overcooked. And I'm like, oh, well, this looks like super fun, and I love the Overcooked developers are amazing, and the game is amazing. And so I sit my wife down, and and she didn't like it. I liked it, but she didn't like it. And and she expl- I said why? And she explained to me. She says, "Well, look, I don't like cooking and cleaning in real life. Why do I want to do it in a video <laughs> game?" I'm like, "Ah, good point. I didn't think of that." And then she also said, "You know, I work hard all day. She owns her own business. She does, you know, um, she works a lot with animals." And and she says at the end of the day, I want to come home and I just want to relax. And like in this game, it's like, do all this stuff and you have two minutes to do it and run around like crazy and bah, panic, panic, panic. And and you when you start to understand the non-gamer and or the casual or hyper-casual gamer and their mindset and how they think, you start to understand why a game like Candy Crush is so popular, right? Because you can just kind of unplug and relax and you kind of, you get these little endorphin hits and you're, 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 you're kind of thinking, but you're not like so focused. And, and, and that's when angry birds and all those style, you know, the biggest, uh, biggest mobile games out there. And so when you look at the industry as a whole, there's 200 million people who are considered gamers, hardcore gamers. That's if you add up all the Microsoft products, all the PlayStation uh, people who play, uh, Nintendo, and our friends who, who are the hardcore PC players who they refer to themselves as the master race. Like, like Matthew. Matthew, Matthew is probably- Not quite that far. Okay. Not quite that far. <laughs> um, but, and so if you add up all those people, that's 200 million people in the world. Yet there's 3.1 billion people who play mobile. And- and mobile is, you know, completely has taken over the industry in regards to dollars, in regards to people who play. So when you do the numbers and you think about the numbers, guys, you say to yourself, wait a second, if there's only 200 million people playing on micro, on Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, and PC, if there's 200 million people playing that, but there's 3.1 billion people playing mobile games, that means that about 7% 
of all the people in the world who play video games, only 7% are playing on PlayStation, Microsoft, and Nintendo Switch and, and PC. Because us as gamers, when we think of video games, what do we think of? Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox, right? Mm -hmm. And But the reality is, going outside our bubble, you see that there's so much potential there. So for me, I didn't want to create something that would directly compete with those 200 million people that Microsoft, Sony, uh, Nintendo, and now I guess Google uh, are trying to compete to get. They're fighting over those 200 million people. I want to fight with the 3.1 billion people over here because look, I'm not sitting over here drinking my own Kool-Aid. We, we don't have a billion dollars in the bank like Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo. We don't have thousands of people around the world working for us, massive infrastructure. We don't have tens of millions of dollars of marketing. We can't compete with their technology, with their chips. We can't lose money when we sell our hardware like they can. We can't compete. I don't want to compete. I don't want to be in competition with those people. But where we can compete with them, we can compete with them in passion and we can compete with them in ideas. So what we've done, think about us as we're the system that is in between the 3.1 billion mobile players. I, I think we would all agree on this. In regards to like from hyper casual to hardcore gaming, I, I think everyone would agree mobile on the bottom, then you have the Nintendo Switch up here, and then a little above that Xbox and PlayStation, and then maybe PC a little above that, right? But there's a big gaping hole that 3.1 billion to those 200 million people. There's a big gaping hole between hyper casual on mobile and what the switch offers. Because again, my mom who bought a Wii, she didn't buy a switch. And that's not to say anything bad about the switch. I personally love the switch. I love Nintendo. I love Sony. I love Microsoft. I think if all of us to really truly, truly call yourself a gamer, you, you should love everything, right? Now you might like ones more than others. Maybe there's things you don't like. Like I don't like things about Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo as well. But I certainly like more. I I I I I more like things than I don't, right? And that's why I'm a fan. So, but but Nintendo Switch is definitely for a certain amazing audience, and they've sold 80 million of them. So that means that out of all the people that play video games in the world about 3% of them are playing on a Nintendo Switch. Um, and so that's, we're trying to, we're trying to, you know, be in between a Switch and mobile. Simple, affordable, family entertainment. That's the four cornerstones and pillars of our company. And those four words spell out safe because in television, all of our games are $9.99 or less digitally and we don't have microtransactions we don't have loot boxes we don't have in-app ads right you buy it once you own it forever all of our games are e for everyone or e10 plus so we don't allow violent games and sexual content and and bad language not that i'm against those stuff some of my favorite games are rated m right but we're creating an ecosystem where our go-to-market strategy is families, it's non-gamers, it's casual gamers, it's hyper-casual gamers, it's seniors, it's families with young, young children. I say, you know, kids five and under. You know, kids, when they get to be like seven, seven eight years old, they go to Roblox and Minecraft, right? Uh, by the time they're 10, 11, they're on the switch, 12, 13, they've, they've graduated to Fortnite. 
teenagers, their PC, uh, their uh, PlayStation, Xbox, and then, you know, hitting their early 20s, maybe that you get into, you know, you get into PC, whatever. And that's kind of a thing. Uh, in statistic, the biggest demographic in the world right now are millennials. It used to be um, uh, baby boomers. Baby boomers were the number one, uh, number one demographic in the world, but then their kids took over about two years ago. Baby boomers are now becoming seniors, right? And a lot of baby boomers, you know, dual analog sticks and, and four shoulder buttons is too much. It's just, it's too much. It's a control. It's a non-starter for them. And again, I'm not saying that baby boomers don't play video games. A lot of people love to take what I say out of context and try to use it against me. I'm not saying that. I'm just being general overall. But the majority of baby boomers, you know, you know, find modern video games too complicated and too violent and too expensive. And the learning curve is just too big. And that's baby boomers, the number one, the, the number two th demographic. So, so then millennials, what do we know about millennials? They're now having children, right? So millennials, late twenties, mid thirties, into the almost late thirties, you know, our parents, all of our parents, they had us in their twenties, right? For the most part, right? Like that, the baby boomers and, and, uh, and my parents who grew up in the fifties, us Gen Xers, our parents were married when they were 23. They had us when they were 25. That was commonplace. But in the 21st century, you know, it's, it's, it's more common now to have your first kid when you're 29 or 30 or 31. That's, you know, that, that's becoming a trend. There's over, uh, there's over 20 million households in the United States alone that have kids under this year, under seven years old. In Europe, there's another 20 million. And if you include Canada and Mexico, so all of North America and all of Europe, there's over 60 million households that have kids under the age of seven. And we have never experienced that in the history of the planet Earth. No time ever. And remember what I said earlier, you know, the number one concern of all of those parents who are having these young kids is that they're giving their kids too much alone screen time. And so now you start to, now you start to see where what we're offering to, to baby boomers, to seniors, to, to, to families with young kids, to people who don't normally play video games. And you say, yeah, but you think that somebody who doesn't you normally buy a video game is going to buy a home console because it's easy and it's simple? Um, Nintendo Wii 15 years ago. So yes, it's already been proved. And Nintendo has a history of having the least technology than, than the competition since the PlayStation and Xbox hit, but having the, the, the better, more fun games. So, so just because you have the fastest processor doesn't mean that you have the best and highest selling console. It, at the end of the day, graphics doesn't matter. What matters is fun. Do you have fun playing it? Yes or no. And that's where our focus is. Our focus is on the fun, not the gigawatts, teraflops. You know? Again, if you do want to watch the full four hour plus interview, we do have that here on the channel. I'll have it linked right up there for you as well. I do want to thank Tommy for taking so much time and spending it with us. And if you haven't done so yet, do me a favor, check out my friend, Life with Matthew, Matthew Bennett, my co-host here during this interview. He does everything from sci-fi, Star Trek, Star Wars, to video game stuff. So go ahead, give him a chance, and I think you will like what you see there. Now, if you are looking for more episodes from this interview, we will be posting them, and we'll have an entire dedicated playlist. And until then, you can go ahead and check out these videos right here.
Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to support the future of Rock Solid Productions, you can do so by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash rocksolid. For as little as a dollar a month, $12 a year, you'll get early access to all of our video content, exclusive content, and a whole lot more. You can also become a channel member here on YouTube for as little as $1.99 a month. And with that, you get a badge next to your name when you comment or post on the channel, and you are acknowledged whether you are a channel member or a Patreon supporter at the end of each and every one of our videos. You can also support the channel by visiting our Teespring store on screen now, where we have t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, masks, cell phone cases, and much more.